Here it is. Okay, so uh, just a couple of things before we begin. My, I guess my plan is going to be to end all the material for the final uh, next Monday. Okay, uh, your final exam, you, you have it a bit early. You have it two weeks from today. So um, yeah, Monday will be the last day where we cover new material. I'm actually almost done writing the study guide for the final. So I'll send you that probably today in the evening. Um, the final will be mostly about the new stuff. Uh, you'll see from the study guide. So I will focus on like the stuff we haven't tested yet. Um, and then uh, my plan is, so Monday we have regular class. Then on um, Thursday we'll have like a review session. And I also would do like a review session with the other class, but there will be different reviews so that you have like twice the, the amount of problems solved. And then uh, we still do have like a class. Um, there's a Monday, I think it's May, May 2nd um, or 1st, I don't remember. That Monday, I'll do it more like kind of like office hours thing. So if someone wants to come and ask me questions, um, we can solve problems. So it would be more like a like a flipped classroom where like you can show up if you want to ask me specific questions. But yeah, so at least uh, there's not that many things um, left to cover. So I'm, I'm pretty pleased with what we have done so far. So Monday will be the last day of officially for the final in terms of material and the rest will be just like more like review if that's okay. Um, I don't know if there are any questions about this before uh, we begin class. Okay, good. So, um, yeah, just feel free to interrupt me if something comes up or you type it on the chat. So today, um, we're going to continue um, analyzing the, these conic sections. So by that, like typically when you talk about conic sections, um, you re you're thinking about ellipses, or, uh, uh, hyperbolas, parabolas. You could also include lines into this family, although it's kind of like a very special case, not like the main focus of attention. In fact, um, for what uh, the technique for the stuff we're going to talk about, uh, the first two ellipses and hyperbolas are the important ones. So like what we'll focus on today is um, like how can you recognize these equations using the stuff about symmetric matrices that we talked about last time? So if you think about uh, what a conic section is, I, I have not written this out too explicitly. So the, the sorts of equations that we're interested in right now are, um, a x squared plus b y squared plus c x y equals b. Okay, um, where a b c d are constants, so um, you know, if you could, uh, the thing is, like, if you could ignore like the last. Uh, the third term in this equation, right? Like the one that has like X and Y multiplied together, then um, it wouldn't be too difficult to identify the equation. So for example, if you only had, um, if, you know, if you had like two X squared plus Y squared equals four, then that's going to be like some sort of a leap. And if you have like, two x squared minus y squared equals four, that actually would be a hyperbola. Uh, basically, uh, hyperbola is where like the, the variables have opposite signs and an ellipse is where like the two variables like come with the same sign. So that's the easiest way to distinguish them. But uh, for example, um, that's, that's the one I'm going to do today, like, um, if I wrote this equation, let me see where I have it. Oh, here you are. If I wrote this equation, 
Well, um, the the idea is that you really shouldn't know what that is. Like question mark, confusion. Be the the reason why you shouldn't it should be hard to tell what this is is because um, this equation has um, this mixed term x y. So the fact that there's like a mixed term, uh, kind of like puts the equation in a form that's not too standard. So what we're going to discuss in more detail today is like that there's this trick involving symmetric matrices that allows you to to kind of get take care of this problem. Okay, is that making sense so far? So the idea, the, the cool thing here um, is that when you see this equation um, of a conic section, you can rewrite it with the help of a matrix. So basically what I was doing uh, last time with a specific example is that you can rewrite uh, this as a multiplication of three things. So the vector x, y written in terms of a row vector, then a two by two matrix, times the vector x, y as uh, a column vector, and this should be equal to t, okay? And what you put in, in the two by two matrix is basically the coefficients that you see here. So a and b go along the diagonal, and c, um, the, the mixed term uh, goes uh, in the off diagonal terms, but, you want the you want to end up making a matrix that's symmetric, and so in fact, like since it's going to appear appear twice, you kind of uh, cut it by half. So what you put here is like c over two, c over two. Okay, and this matrix is like I mean it's kind of like a fun multiplication to do. If you do this product, you should try doing this product to. To make sure to re to realize that you get uh, this equation, okay. But this matrix is going to be symmetric. Is that making sense so far? And so because it is symmetric, then you can uh, use the result from last time, which basically says that any symmetric matrix can be diagonalized. But the important thing is that if the diagonalization is going to be uh, done using an orthogonal matrix. In fact, we can do it, use the, um, do the diagonalization using a rotation matrix. So here's what we're about to do. So we're going to write A as R, D are transpose um, where um, R is going to be the matrix of eigenvectors, right? The important thing here is that it will, these eigenvectors, uh, the way you choose them, they have to be chosen in such a way that they have length one. Uh, they are already perpendicular if the, um, they correspond to eigenvalues, or, which are different. But the important thing here is that these eigenvectors should be, no, let me write both conditions, should be orthonormal. So that meant, again, like length one and mutually perpendicular and perpendicular. And D is going to be the, the matrix of eigenvalues, which we have used in the past. Okay.
So what I'm going to do here, and uh, back to this equation, oh, let me give you a zoom out so that you can see everything. So I'm going to replace this A with R, the R transpose. Okay. And so the equation becomes x, y times r. Let me put d in different colors times the r transpose times x, y. So you, when you do that substitution, then uh, that's how it will end up looking. Is that make, uh, well, let me stop here. Is that making sense? Any questions up to this point? The hearts are good. So what we're going to do is call the, the trick. You'll see uh, in the example that I'm about to do, but the idea is to call this multiplicate, this product. This is going to give you a new vector, okay? And you think of this new vector as like um, new variables, which we call x prime, y prime. So the idea is to call this x prime, y prime. And what happens with this term? Well, if you think about this term, that's basically what you get by having transpose this one. Because uh, if you remember the, the properties of the transpose, it changes the order of the multiplication and transposes every term. So by doing uh, this in, in this particular way, this term just becomes x prime y prime so the equation of the of the section of the of this conic section just becomes x prime y prime. What was d? D is um, d is like a diagonal matrix. If you remember, it's like the matrix of eigenvalues. So you put here lambda one, zero, zero, lambda two, um, and then x prime y prime. But the thing, uh, the cool thing now is that there's zeros on the uh, outside the diagonal, right? This is the diagonal matrix. And so this multiplication is a lot easier to do. And in fact, it will give you the equation lambda one x prime squared plus lambda two y prime squared equals d. And the miraculous thing that happens if you look at this equation is that there's no more mixed terms. There's no like x prime, y prime, right? So let me write that down. Is that making sense? So the, 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 the stuff that we're doing right now is just with the purpose of um, getting rid of the mixed term. And so what we will do, you'll see is that we will identify the conic section by drawing it in terms of like a new set of axis, axis x prime, y prime. Is that okay? Any questions up to this point? Just had a thought while looking at this. Um, will lambda one and lambda two, will they always be like different from each other? Uh, okay, no, actually um, the thing is like, um, like kind of the interesting cases where when they are different, because if lambda, I don't know if you remember this, like uh, I think we did it last time when we found like an explicit formula for the eigenvalue. Uh, I mean, yeah, no, it, 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 it's fine. It, it is allowed to be the same, uh, you know, when they happen to be the same. It's just if lambda one equals lambda two is, uh, Essentially, it's like an, a circle automatically because you know you divide. Let's say you divide both sides by lambda one on this equation, right? So you get like x 
prime squared plus y prime, prime squared equals d over lambda one, if that makes sense. So, hmm. I mean, of course, if, depending on the sign of d over lambda one, if d over lambda one, we need to be positive for that to be a circle, right? If it were negative, then you wouldn't, if, like the equation would have no solution, which is fine. But I'm just saying, no, lambda one equals lambda two is allowed. It's just kind of like a very straightforward situation. Um, in fact, is that answering your question? Yeah, I think so. Actually, I also had like a side question and that was like, mm -hmm. if you have a, a whatever n by n matrix that has less than n unique eigenvectors, can it still be like diagonalized using A equals R, D, R inverse? Uh, oh, oh, so, um, so let me, uh, okay. So for example, just to make it more concrete, if you had a three by three matrix, right? Um, mm -hmm. you, you could have two eigenvalues and that could still be diagonalizable. I actually will do an example of that in the review section. So you sure. could have like, for example, a three by three, three, three by three metrics with two eigenvalues, um, which are, which still happens to be diagonalizable, but you, you always require three linearly independent eigenvectors because otherwise, the, I mean, the thing that's happening here is that the matrix are, the reason why we're being allowed to put our, our transpose here, right? Is because our transpose was like our inverse. If you remember for like an orthogonal matrix. So yeah. um, maybe, I should, uh, and so it is important to have like the matrix being invertible. So for example, if you only had like two eigenvectors for like a three by three matrix, then like, um, well, first like the, what do you put in the third column, right? Of this matrix R, but also, but also like, it's just like the, if you try to repeat one of the eigenvectors for some reason, it just wouldn't be like an invertible matrix. In fact, it won't be like orthogonal. I mean, in that sense, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I was just, I guess I haven't figured out yet with the two eigenvalues. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I think I just need to do an example. But yeah, I don't know why I haven't done an example um, where like an eigenvalue gets repeated. So I'll, I'll show you uh, once we do the review, like how it looks. But what, it's fine to have um, fewer eigenvalues. So you could have even one eigenvalue and the matrix is diagonalizable. What you might always have is the same number of eigenvectors as the size of the matrix. That cannot be, that's non-negotiable. Like, so one must agree is the number of eigenvectors with the size, but the number of eigenvalues actually, sometimes like it would be 10, if it's a 10 by 10, sometimes it would be five, if it's 10 by 10 and it could still both work. But you do have to, you kind of have to look at uh, uh, in a case by case matrix. What's true, what is true is that if you have like an n by n matrix and you have n different eigenvalues, then it would be, for example, diagonalizable or uh, and things like that. But um, but yeah, it is. Uh, no, no, it's a good question. It, it is important to point this out. So I'll I just uh, I'll do one example where you can see explicitly um, what happens when there are few. When there are fewer eigenvalues, um, it still can be diagonalized. Um, but yeah, it's good to have like a concrete example. Thank you. Is, is that making sense? Yeah, sure, sure, no problem. Uh, and there are any other questions? In fact, I mean, if you want like, uh, like kind of a spoiler alert like what happens like uh just already knowing like someone asked me this in the other class like once you know the eigenvalues of the symmetric matrix you more you kind of know whether it's going to be a, a circle or like an, a hyper an ellipse or a hyperbola because if these two eigenvalues have the same sign essentially it's going to be in like an ellipse and if lambda one lambda two have opposite sign it has to be like an, a, a hyperbola so the only reason why we're doing extra work besides looking at the eigenvalues is because uh, say, if you wanted to actually draw the picture, it is important to know the rotation matrix. So you, that will become more clear in the example I'm about to show you. But just knowing whether it's a hyperbola or an ellipse only requires eigenvalues. If you want more details of how the actual curve looks like, uh, you do need to, you do need to know the rotation, the matrix R. Okay. So let me go back, oops, sorry. So back, let's do an example so that uh, this is more clear.
Okay, let's say I, I give you this equation, which is like the one I wrote, wrote a couple minutes ago. If you want to write this as a mat in matrix form, right, you write x, y times the two by two matrix. The two by two matrix, again, are the coefficients that appear here, is one, zero. Zero is because there's no y squared. So you have to put zero because it's zero y squared. And then the mixed term just gets cut in half. So each entry along outside the diagonal is minus square root minus square root. Okay. So that's how the matrix looks like in this case. And this is symmetric as you can see, and then you have to find the eigenvalues for this matrix. Okay, so I'll give you the eigenvalues um, for this matrix. I mean, a lot of the problems on the final will be just about eigenvalues and eigenvectors because we're using them over and over. So in certain problems on the final, I will just tell you parts of the information, like telling you, oh, this matrix has these eigenvalues or things like that. So you don't have to redo the same exact thing like multiple times uh, because like at least like four or five problems <laughs> will require you to some extent like finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So I don't want to kind of like test that like a lot of like many, many, many times on the final. So I'll probably just give you certain, depending on the problem, I'll give you like partial information so you don't have to do everything from zero because it would just take forever. So like, for example, like in, some pro in a problem like this, I'll probably just give you like the eigenvalues of the matrix A. So like you can save yourself some time. And also uh, sometimes when you solve the quadratic equation, people will make silly mistakes and I don't want that to ruin the rest of the problem. So, um, so one eigenvalue is um, two and the corresponding eigenvector would be nine minus root of two, one. And the other eigenvalue for this matrix is minus one. And the corresponding eigenvector would be one over root of two, one. Is that making sense so far so good? Now, if this were like a regular diagonalization problem, right, then you could build the matrix of eigenvectors just by putting this as the first column and this as the second column, and then you would be done. But you must remember that here, like it is for a symmetric matrix, so we can kind of do it a little bit better. And doing it a little bit better just means using vec vectors that are of size one. So these two vectors do not have length one, and so, what we're going to do is just rescale them so that we do have like a vectors of size one. Uh, and remember that because if this is a symmetric matrix um, and the eigenvalues are different, the two vectors are automatically perpendicular. You can check that the dot product between these two is zero. So worrying about having um, perp perpendicular eigenvectors kind of is, comes for free just from the fact that we're working with a symmetric matrix and it's like a two by two case, but making them of length one is something that is actually important for you to remember to doing. So, so if you check the, um, the length of the first vector is root of three, three and then V1 is just, let me change the color here. V1 is just U1 divided by its length. And that should give you, I mean, minus root, minus root of two thirds and one over root of three. Okay. And the length of U2 is um, root of three halves. So V2, let me change the color again. V2 would just be U2 over its length. And so this would be um, one over root three, um, two, uh, root of two thirds. Okay. 
Okay. So that's what the two eigenvectors are. And the point is that they continue to be mutually perpendicular because you just rescale them. So that when rescaling the vectors won't change the angle between them. And then they will be um, of length one. Is that making sense? Any questions about this? So the matrix you would like to try using is uh, the matrix whose eigenvectors, whose columns are these eigenvectors. So you would like to try to use this matrix. Okay, but what's the determinant of this matrix? Looks like a negative one. Yeah, it's going to be negative one. Perfect. So if you remember, I really want a rotation matrix. So the only thing that's needed for it to be like a, a rotation matrix instead of just like a general orthogonal matrix is that rotation matrix is where the ones that had determinant one. So if you want this to make it, make it determinant one, what you should do is reverse the order of the columns, okay? Because by doing that, like if you remember like the properties of determinant, once you flip the rows or columns of a matrix, you change the sign of the determinant. So our matrix is actually uh, more or less the same, but with the, you know, with the columns uh, flipped. So this is this would be the first column, and this would be the second column. And then this one is determinant one and it's uh, orthogonal. And uh, I mean, you don't have to check that it's orthogonal. It comes from the properties of the, just comes for free from the fact that you're using orthonormal vectors. Okay. And so this is like a legitimate rotation matrix. So that means that R being a rotation matrix is of the form cosine of theta minus sine of theta, sine of theta, cosine of theta, and that I'll show you what this angle of rotation means uh, in a moment once I, I put this on the algebra. But uh, what this means is the cosine of theta, if you compare the entries, has to be one over root of three. And the sine of theta, if you compare the entries, has to be root of two thirds. I mean, this is not a special angle on the exam. I'll probably just give you like values where it just comes like a special angle. So that like, you know, 30, 60 or 45, so that you can find the angle explicitly. But you know, just because this is just a random example, I don't care too much about that. So if you were to go to a, use a calculator, well, for math or whatever, this angle of rotation would be 54.74 degrees. I mean, it's an approximate, approximate number. It's not quite that. Um, Okay, uh, that's like, um, so, so that's the first important step that we already found the matrix R and the matrix D, the matrix D is uh, the matrix of eigenvalues. And it's just the, you know, you have to put in the first entry the eigenvalue corresponding to the first column. That's the eigenvalue negative one. And you have to put in the second entry, the along the diagonal, the second eigenvalue, which is the eigenvalue two, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. 
so so this gives you the equation of the conic becomes x y times um, r times r, but r was this thing. Um, let me see if I can copy this. Uh, because when I paste it, I can decrease the size. This is convenient. Times the diagonal matrix. Times R transpose. So what is R transpose? It's just transposing this matrix. Let me copy it again, paste it here. So for the transpose, you just change the sign uh, of the third. If you look, the transpose is not a different, you just change it, put a minus sign in this one. And then you get X, Y. Okay, so this is the conic equation now. And this is all being set equal to four. Okay, because like literally this is what A was. Like if you remember, A was R, D, R transpose. So I'm just substituting A in terms of the rotation matrix and the diagonal matrix. Is that making sense? And then again, like if you want, I mean, not that it's super necessary, but um, if you do the product, so let's see, here you have minus one, zero, zero, two, let's say the diagonal matrix untouched. And then, uh, oops, this is going to be a little bit big. So this is going to be X plus root of two Y over root of three, and then minus root of two X plus Y over root of three. When you do, that's what you get when you do, um, this becomes this, that's what you are getting here. Let me, I can highlight it actually for you. So this product becomes this vector. And then, uh, you get the same for the other one, but transpose. So it's just x plus root of two y over th root of three and minus root of two x plus y over root of three. Okay, so this one becomes that one. Okay. Is that making sense? And uh, what I'm saying is that these two entries are the things that we call um, X prime, Y prime. So this is like X prime, Y prime, X prime, Y prime. So that at the end of the day, this just becomes minus X prime squared plus um, two Y prime squared equals four. And that's a hyperbola. That okay, I'm about to show you this how, how it looks like on GeoGebra. So far, so good. Any questions before I go to uh, the uh, GeoGebra animation? Okay, um, let me see if I can show you how this looks like. Let me share my GeoGebra here. Okay. So let me put zero, zero, this is useful. That's where zero, zero is going to be. Okay, so first, like if you want, you. I mean, this is what this day you would do in practice, but 
um, you could go, uh, you can just enter in GeoGebra the equation as I wrote it in terms of X and Y. So you would write X squared minus two is square root of two times X, Y equals four. Okay, and that's a hyperbola that um, we have been discussing about. So this is how it looks. But if you think about it, I mean, I don't know how much you have thought about hyperbolas, but it does seem like it is rotated with respect to the standard one, okay? So to think about that better, what you can do is represent the eigenvectors. So the first eigenvector, and that's by that I just mean the one on the first column. The first column was one over square root of three. I'm typing, I don't know if everyone can see me typing on the algebra, but I'm typing one over square root of three and square root of two thirds. So that's the first eigenvector, okay? Which is, an, so the, the vector itself, uh, where do I have my option for? Vector? Oh, here it is, uh, vector. No. Oh, here it is. The first vec I, the first vector is this one. Okay. Hopefully, it looks kind of of having length one, and the second eigenvector is the one that you get by entering the entries of the second column. So it's minus square root of two thirds, one over square root of three. So that's the second eigenvector. And then um, the, the, I don't know, let's see if I, we can zoom in. Hopefully it, you, you're persuaded that this is like an angle of 90 degrees, right? So like what you should really think about is that you're taking literally the X and Y axis, right? And you're rotating them so that the X axis now becomes this one and the Y axis becomes this one. So it is like a rotating coordinate system. It, it, if you kind of move your head so that it's aligned with the new axis, the hyperbola will look like as it's normally supposed to look like. So. It, if that makes sense. So like the effect of the rotation is kind of to put the things in a way that's more convenient to for analyzing the equation. Uh, and if you want to see that this is actually the and the angle that I claimed, you can draw the vector uh, E1 or I if you have taken these physics classes. So here's the vector E1, okay? And then you can measure the angle between the these three vectors. And you see it's like around like the value that I gave you uh, earlier. So what that means is that if you rotate the vector i by this angle theta, that x goes to x prime. Um, and that is like the rotation of the coordinate system that you implemented. Is that making sense? So that's the meaning of the angle of rotation. That's like how much you have to rotate the x, y axis to, to get like the new set of coordinate where the equation looks nice. Is that making sense? Any questions about this? So it's nice. Uh, again, this, has, like, it, it, this can also be done in the three by three case. Um, in that case, like it's instead of like elliptic or hyperbola, you would have a ellipsoid, hyperboloid, things like that. Uh, if you saw the video that I had sent you about on the announce on the previous announcement, you can also use this thing to prove the second derivative test in multivariable calculus, because essentially uh, what happens is that you have like a function of two variables and you can do like a Taylor expansion for that function. Uh, you and then you can associate like a two by two matrix to that a Taylor expansion, which is symmetric and it's called the Hessian. And then you diagonalize them. the Hessian since it's symmetric, you can diagonalize it with this technique. And then you can identify whether it's a max or a mean or a saddle point depending on the eigenvalues of the fashion. So in fact, that, like you could, if people took like this as a requisite for multivariable, you could explain the second derivative test in terms of eigenvalues of a matrix, uh, which is a fun thing to do. Okay. Um, is that making sense? 
Okay, so before we move to the next topic, let me just, um, I was going to mention another application of this stuff. Uh, I don't know, I'll type it um, on the chat because maybe it's not uh, a word you have seen before. Uh, anyone knows what a spectroscopy is or an spectrometer? Oh, good venture to give a want to give a, a, a short answer when that what is. <laughs> I think it's like a thing that beams light at um through a sample, I guess, and I think it might measure absorbance readings. Uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, let me bring my prism. Give me a second. Yeah, so maybe uh, you have done this, like, um, this is like a typical physics experiment. This is actually one of the, the experiments Newton did. Uh, you, if, when you take a prism, um, you can kind of like decompose like the light into like well kind of like the colors of the rainbow or like the light breaks into components of uh, and it breaks into uh, different the different colors uh and so on a, a spectrometer uh the idea about that is like essentially you take like a gas you could take like a gas of helium or a gas of hydrogen you put it put it into like a container and you pass like an electric current through it and that excites the gas um and the gas will emit certain uh, light, in, I mean, certain specific colors of light. So let me make this more concrete. I have my spectrometer here. I don't know if you can see the anim this animation. So this is called the atomic spectra. This is like what chemistries, chemists use to identify atoms, like molecule, uh, like to, uh, yeah, to distinguish atoms, uh, the element, uh, like elements, I should say. Like to know if you're working with a sample hydrogen or helium or something else. So every atom, every element has its own like spectrum. So it's kind of like the ID or the DNA of the atom, of the element. And so this kind of like, I don't know if you, could, if you can see the lines too clearly, but this is kind of like showing you what, what are the, the colors that the atom the or the element emits. So if you, the kind of like the obvious thing to notice in this, um, in, in this like uh, app, uh, well, in these pictures, is that it only every element only emits certain particular, certain particular colors. Or as, in fact, like you can in certain in instead of talking about colors, you can talk about the frequency of the light that's being emitted or the wavelength, and that's kind of like the, this what these numbers correspond to. So this is kind of stands for wavelength. But the the important thing just is just that uh, every element kind of is, emits a certain values. And so, like at the beginning of the ninth, like twentieth century, early late nineteenth century, a big thing was kind of to try to understand why do the elements or the atoms emit these particular patterns, right? Like if there was like an explanation for for why this is the way it is. So let me uh, let's see if I can share my iPad again. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, there was, uh, so, right. Like one thing that it needed an explanation is why the, the element uh, emit would have the, the particular spectrum that they do have. The other thing that was kind of confusing uh, early 20th century was why is matter stable? So, So if you think, for example, of like the hydrogen atom or like that, which is kind of the simplest atom, like you have like a, and these early atomic models for the nucleus or like the atom, you have like um, the like a proton or something like that. So like a proton, which is positively charged and an electron, um, which is negatively charged, right? Um, 
So I don't like, um, well, you know, um, there's like a, a inverse Kurz law of electric of electric attraction, which is Coulomb's law. But the important thing is like uh, opposite charges attract. So if you had somehow like the electron kind of orbiting the proton, the problem that happens is that if an electromagnetism, if you have like a charge that accelerates, then it will emit radiation or it will emit light. So what was going to like what the predictions would have were is like it would start losing energy because it's emitting light and kind of it would start spiraling it down onto onto the nucleus. So the question was, why is it that uh, things don't collapse? Why isn't that uh, the electrons kind of like how can they remain at a distance from the proton or the nucleus, if that makes sense? So that's kind of what's known as the stability of matter problem. And the way it was solved uh, by Bohr and Heisenberg, Schrodinger, and others um, was by doing this thing called quantum mechanics. And so what happened, uh, what, like, I mean, uh, as a rough approximation, the way they solved the problem was by saying, well, I mean, this is kind of the modern way to say it. It's not necessarily how they, like at the beginning, they thought about this. But um, what they would say is like, well, you associate a vector to the electron, for example, this vector is called the wave, fun wave function, so it's not how like the physicists would write it, like they would use a different notation or this, but it's really like a vector. And then uh, they would say, well, this wave fun this vector is in, in fact, um, can only, ex like, that these orbits, like the way you can find them is because uh, these, like the corresponding vector has to be an eigenvector of a matrix. <laughs> So this is supposed to be an eigenvector of the matrix. This matrix is called H. That H represents, it stands for Hamiltonian, but that's a, uh, again, not too important right now. And so, <laughs> but being an eigenvector uh, is satisfies the eigenvalue equation or eigenvector equation. And instead of calling that eigenvalue lambda, you just call it E, and that E actually represents the energy of the system. So this eigenvalue E is like the energy. And then in the in their model, what happened is, is um, you know, like the vector, I mean, there could be different eigenvectors possible. So there could be like different orbits. And when the electron jumped between orbits for like, to put it in some way, it's changing its eigenvalues. And so there's like an energy difference because there's like a, a different orbits correspond to different eigenvalues. And the energy difference is what produces the light with a certain frequency. So the energy difference in the, or the difference of eigenvalues is what gives you like the specific colors of the light. Uh, it's what determines the frequency of the light that's emitted. So. Okay, but so basically like all these models of like, in fact, like all the the models of how like chemistry works, like or protons and, and molecules and all of this works is using quantum mechanics, which at the end of the day uses linear algebra uh, multiple times. So in fact, like the many things like that we have done uh, starting in, in this course, like kind of have like, in, in, important implications for like the behavior of matter and other things. Okay. Let's see. Well, that's an interesting thing to keep up, keep in mind. Okay, and then the last topic for today that I wanted to tell you about was, uh, and this will be the last topic for the final as well. I will finish in on Monday. It's about like finding what's the orthogonal complement to a, a vector space. So let me talk about that.
So here, what do I mean by this? So we are going to have a vector space B. And the orthogonal complement is called B pair. It just consists of all the vectors which are perpendicular of the vectors which are perpendicular to every vector of V. Okay. Is that making sense? So we are looking for all the vectors that are perpendicular to a given vector space. So let me explain what I mean by this. I don't know if you remember the vector space which we had done in the past, used in the past. Anyone remembers how that look like looks like? It would be a plane in three D space. Good, good. Yeah, it is a plane. Perfect. So you draw a plane. I mean, uh, let me try to draw something. Don't take it too seriously, but it is a plane. So it's, it's two dimensions, right? And so this is a plane. And so the orthogonal complement will be all the vectors perpendicular to this plane. So let me try to draw something of what I mean. It would be try to, we're trying to find like the vectors that kind of look like this. So if, if you think of the plane as a piece of paper, right? We are trying to find these vectors that make a 90 degree angle with a point, if that makes sense. Is that okay? Oops. So the idea to find these, these vectors, right? So we want everything to be, uh, like this is an important uh, condition. We want the vector to be perpendicular to every single vector of the plane, right? But here's the cool thing. Uh, uh, we're about to find like a basis for this plane if you forgot about this one. But if you remember how this basis, like if you remember like the plane is should be two dimensional. So it, it should have like a basis uh, of make, consisting of two vectors. So if you call V1 and V2 the a basis for V, Right, then any other vector on this plane is a linear combination, right, of the basis. That's the whole point of having a basis, right? So what would be the dot product uh, between U and, and V? Well, the dot product between U and V would be the dot product between these two, these, um, the vector U and this linear combination. But the important thing of the dot product is that it distributes. So it actually gives you C1 U dot V1 plus C2 U dot V2. Is that make, well, let me stop here to, to see if it makes sense what I'm saying up to this point. Is that okay? Any questions about this? So if you make U perpendicular to each of the basis vectors, right? If you make U perpendicular to V1 and V2, then that will make it automatically perpendicular to every other vector on the vector space. So that's in general how we will find the orthogonal complement. You just find a basis for V and then just re 
at find the vectors that are perpendicular to every vector of that basis. So, like, let me write that down explicitly. The remark to find a basis to find v start or v perp, you find a basis for v. And then, um, and then you find V perp by by asking U to be perpendicular to every vector of the basis. Okay. Is that making sense? Uh, so let's start to do this in our example. So V, right? V in our example was X, Y, Z, where x plus y plus c equals zero, right? Uh, well, we kind of did this in meter two, I don't know if you remember, but to find a basis for v, what you do is that like use the equation that defines the plane to solve for one of the variables. So for example, I could say that z equals like minus x minus y, right? And so x, y, z, it was x, y minus x minus y. And then you just uh, remember you were supposed to break this down into the stuff with x, x and stuff with y. So the stuff with x is one, zero, minus one. And the stuff with y is zero, one, negative one. Okay. And this is a vector v1. And this is a vector v2. So th that v1 and v2 form the basis. Is that making sense? Uh, questions up to this point. And so if you want a vector in V perp, right? So if U is a vector in V perp, what you need is U dot V1 to be zero, and you also need U dot V2 to be zero. So what you need to do is make it all the all these two dot products equal zero. But what is u dot v1? u dot v1 is x, y, z dot one, zero, negative one. And that gives you x minus z. And what is u dot v2? That's um, x, y, z dot zero, one, negative one. And that's y minus z. So what we need is x minus z to be zero and y minus z to be zero. Is that making sense? Is that okay? Questions up to this point? Now, obviously, this is a system of equations that's extremely easy to solve, right? But let me write it as a matrix notation so that um, I can tell you what's going to happen in general. So, if we, I mean, this is very easy to solve. This would never be needed but in, in real life, but just to write it like more, more like theoretically useful. If you write this as a matrix, it would be 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, negative 1. Right, so that's the matrix associated to this system of equations. In fact, this is like a homogeneous system, right? It, that's going to be, that's what is going to be uh, correct. Uh, yes, yes, yes. 
In fact, like here, it's such an easy system that there was no need to reduce it, right? But like the only reason why I'm writing it this way is that if you look at this matrix A, right, this is a matrix whose rows, what are the rows of this matrix? The rows of this matrix, if you look at it, right, are the, are the, are the vectors V1 and V2 from before. Well, in fact, like, let me also write that what you're saying here, like, right, this system says that uh, X has to be Y equals Z. So when you take X, Y, Z, that means that it had to be X times one, 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 right? So that means that every vector in V perp is a multiple of one, one, one. Okay, let me, if, if, I, if I can go up uh, a little bit. So that means that you have to be one, one, one. And that's why actually, if you ever take multivariable calculus, what's called the normal vector to the plane. Okay. So now this is like the way we would find it. But right, like what this is saying is that any vector that's perpendicular to this plane is a multiple of one, one, one. Is that making sense? But it, like this, like hopefully it kind of shows you what happens in general. So in general, to find the perp, you can solve, you can solve, solve AX equals zero, where A is a matrix whose rows are a basis for V. And this is the most important thing of, of what I have said thus far concerning the verb V perp. So to find V perp, you actually solve a homogeneous system, but what you put in the matrices of this homogeneous system is the, ba is the basis for V. So what does that mean is, well, let me, before I keep asking questions, uh, are, is that making sense to everyone? Any? So far, so good. Any uh, questions about this? So what does it mean to, uh, what was the name that we gave to the solutions of the homogeneous system? There was an important name that we gave to the vectors that solve a homogeneous system. I'm typing the first letter in the chat. Yeah, the null space, perfect. So that means that the B, B perp is actually the null space of A where A is this matrix of basis vectors. So V perp is just a null space. So you see like, this is kind of like the funny thing of linear of the of this linear algebra course that we keep coming back to the older stuff, but just from a different perspective. So we're going to find again, null spaces. I mean, like, or better said, you already know how to find null spaces is that now we think of them as being orthogonal complements. Okay, so, And what, what that also tells you, because it's a null space, is that then V perp is a vector space, then V perp is a vector space of what dimension? What was the dimension of the null, of a null space? It 
it's very close to the word <laughs> to the word no space no itself right it just has a little bit more letters at the end of the of the phrase right The uh, nullity of A. Right, right, right. It was the nullity of A. Good. But what was the nullity of a matrix? It was uh, the the number of columns of A, right? Minus the rank of A, right? But if you choose uh, the matrix A, where all the all the rows are basis vectors, right? The rank is just the dimension of V, right? Because like, for example, in the plane, V had dimension two, and we had to use two basis vectors so there were two rows for A. So it's actually the number of columns of A minus the dimension of V. And from there, you get to this import, very important result, which is the dimension of V plus dimension of V perp, is the number of columns of A. But what is the number of columns of A? If you think about it, that's the size of the vectors. So for example, in this matrix, which has three columns, A, but the vectors are of size three. So I'll remind, I'll restart this here next time to refresh it, but size of the vectors or number of entries of the vectors. And this is one of the most uh, important results of other linear algebra. The, the dimension of B plus dimension of B perp is the number of entries of the vectors. I mean, it would be called like dimension of Rn or something like that, if you want to make it more like mathematically not, uh, fancy. But it is what's uh, essentially what I just uh, said. Uh, the, 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 the takeaway here is like to find B perp, you find a null space and its dimension adds up with the dimension of D to the like, dimension of the entire space, basically. And that also tells you, and, I, and again, we'll do it next time. It also tells you that any vector in space can be decomposed into a part that is in V and another part that is in V perp. And that would take us to talking about these orthogonal matrices, uh, orthogonal projection matrices, which is the last topic that we will have on the final. So we'll do that on Monday. Uh, but it's like a good way to finish because with that, I can explain to you. Uh, uh, oh, okay, good, good, good. Is that a, this is kind of a, in general, I mean, this is kind of also always like a fact, like just um, let me explain it. Uh, like, let's just make it more concretely, like, you know, imagine, imagine that the, the vectors, right, had like four, four entries, right? Since I'm writing it as rows, and to have, I have supposed to write the vectors as rows. So the number of columns of that matrix would be four. Is that making sense? Correct, yeah, if you think about it in this one, in this case, oops. No, no, it, yeah, but it's a good point. Uh, since I'm writing them as rows, right? Like the number of columns agrees with the number of entries of the vector. Is that it just sounds better uh, in this equation to say the size of the vector or number of entries than just saying the number of columns of A because there's like kind of you want to get rid of the matrix A at the end of the day. So. But yeah, I'll repeat this next time um, as a refresher uh, and I'll tell you how to use it to find these orthogonal matrices. Okay. Uh, good. So I think this is what I wanted to say for today. I'll see you on Monday. Again, Monday will be an, our next last class in terms of theory. The other, the other remaining two classes would be more like type review things. So I'll keep you updated. I'll send you like a study guide for the final today. Um, I'll make an announcement once it's uh, ready. But yeah, enjoy your weekend. If any of you, there are no more questions, uh, feel, feel free to go. Thank you, Professor. Have a good one. You too, you too. Bye.